Our upcoming experiment in Chem 1211K uses computational chemistry, and in this video, I wanted to give an introduction to the experiment by actually showing you the results of some of the calculations that you'll do and talking about the, the purpose of the calculations and what we're trying to get at through these calculations. I'm not going to talk much about how WebMO works. WebMO is the tool we're going to use to actually do computational chemistry, but I have a companion tutorial video in which we build the formate anion, optimize its geometry, and look at its molecular orbitals that you should definitely check out before watching this video, and I'll link to it inside of this video. Here, I wanted to focus on the different parts of the experiment, and there are three parts of the experiment that focus on different things that computational chemistry can do for you. In part A, we're going to focus on the limitations of the VSEPR model. The broader lesson here is that computational chemistry has the ability to explore chemical theory at a very high level of complexity due to the amazing computational power of computers. So we can do computations using, for example, quantum theory of molecules that would have been impossible before computers existed. And we'll see how that leads us to new insights about molecular structure and new insights over relatively simple models like the VSEPR model through calculations. In part B, we're going to similarly extend the idea of the Lewis model of structure or Lewis structures by looking at molecules for which resonance is important and seeing how these look quantum mechanically or quantum chemically. When we look at, for example, the distribution of electrons in a molecule based on quantum theory, which we get out of a computation, it looks very different from the much simpler Lewis structural prediction. However, resonance gives us insight into that quantum mechanical picture. We'll try to make the connection between the two in part B of this experiment. Finally, in part C, we're going to use calculations, computations, computational chemistry, to explore the differences between two possible intermediates in the course of a reaction mechanism. These are structures that occur in between the reactants and products in the course of a reaction, and they give us insight into how a reaction works and how we can work to improve it. And so in part C, we're going to look at two different structures with the same formula, both of which might arise in the course of a reaction, and explore which of them has lower energy, which generally corresponds to the more likely intermediate in the actual me physical mechanism that occurs since nature prefers to follow a low energy path. So with that overview out of the way, let's dive into some specific examples of these, these calculations. So the first one from part A focuses on the limitations of the VSEPR model and differences between VSEPR idealized molecular structures and structures that we get out of quantum mechanical geometry optimizations, geometry optimizations that really take advantage of molecular orbitals and a more nuanced perspective on where electrons are located in structures. So SF4 is the first molecule here, and I just want to show you the results of the computation and talk a little bit about the differences between what we're about to see and what VSEPR theory would predict. So here we see SF4, and based on the VSEPR theory prediction, right, this molecule has five electron pair domains, four bonds to the four fluorines, and then a non-bonding or lone pair of electrons at sulfur forms the fifth electron pair domain, and we can roughly locate that about here. Now, based on that, we would say that this molecule has a trigonal bipyramidal electron group arrangement with that lone pair kind of occupying an equatorial position. Here are the other two equatorial fluorines, and the axial fluorines would be here and here. That VSEPR model would predict a 180-degree bond angle between these two fluorines with the central sulfur and a 120-degree bond angle in the equatorial plane between these two fluorines. And it's, it's fairly obvious, for example, if we look along the axial direction, that this prediction is not borne out by the data. If we look here, for example, and we select these three atoms that should be at an angle of 180, we're seeing an angle of about 164 on the acute uh, or the uh, shallower side, we might say, which is quite a bit different from the 180 we've predicted in the VSEPR model. And similarly, even if we look in the equatorial plane, we can see that the angle here is very different from 180 deg uh, 120 degrees, sorry, 106 degrees. So these angles are very different from VSEPR theoretical predictions. And the reason for that is that the quantum chemistry used to generate this structure is a more nuanced, more physically realistic model of how electrons work inside molecules. So you'll see this in SF4 and a number of different molecules in part A in the first part of this experiment. 
Now, part B focuses on resonance, and we're going to look at two molecules to drive home points about limitations of the Lewis structure model of molecular structure and how resonance manifests itself in quantum chemical calculations, the quantum picture of electrons and molecules. And so I'll just highlight the carbonate anion here for a second. So what we're going to do is build the carbonate anion in, in Weber mode, that's CO3 two minus. If we think about the Lewis structural model, these oxygens, oxygens three and four, would be predicted to have the negative charge, right? These have three non-bonding lone pairs that we can't see, but we can imagine them being there. And oxygen two has two non-bonding lone pairs and a double bond, which suggests that this atom would be neutral. So really the, the general point here is that the oxygens look very different from the Lewis structure perspective. And this structure we're looking at still has some of that Lewis information built in with the double bond and the single bonds. However, if we look at the properties of this molecule as calculated during the geometry optimization, some strange patterns begin emerging. So focus on oxygens two, three, and four. Let's look at the charges of these three oxygens as calculated by WebMO. If we come down to partial charges, notice that the partial charges on all three oxygens are, for all intents and purposes, within the you know, precision of the computation, equal. Right? These numbers are essentially equal, even though the oxygens look different within the Lewis structure. Remember, the picture you're seeing here is a quantum chemical picture. That means it's much more physically realistic than really any model that a human being can handle by doing some scribbles on a piece of paper. So this is giving us some physical insight that Lewis structures cannot, and highlighting an important limitation of the Lewis model. The Lewis model can't represent partial charges, right, between zero and negative one like this. It can't represent decimal charges. The fact that the carbon atom is also partially positive is also interesting. We couldn't get that from the pure Lewis model as well. We're going to compare in part B of the experiment some of these um, outcomes, the partial charges, the bond angles, which just to highlight that briefly, if we look at the bond angles, we would expect, you know, based on the, the Lewis model maybe, that this angle between atoms two, one, and four is different from the angle between atoms three, one, and four, since oxygen two is doubly bonded while the other oxygens are singly bonded. However, if we look at the actual bond angles, essentially all of them are, again, within the precision of the calculation, equal at an angle of 120 degrees. This is a trigonal planar molecule. So we're gonna explore that in part B of the experiment for the carbonate anion, and then we're going to, in essence, add H plus, add a proton to one of these oxygens and look at bicarbonate, the, um, the conjugate acid of this molecule, to observe the differences. What happens when we make one of these oxygens different by tacking on a proton or a hydrogen to it? Finally, in part C of the experiment, we're going to do two calculations on structures that are isomeric, that have the same molecular formula, but different structures to explore how a reaction works. And this is a very common and actually growing and important area of, of computational chemistry um, where it's used to make inferences or predictions about how reaction mechanisms work. The actual reaction we're going to look at is not so important. Uh, it's described in the lab manual. It's the chlorination of an alkene. The basic idea is that a positively charged chlorine, Cl plus, quote unquote, is added to a compound containing a carbon-carbon double bond. This can happen in one of two different ways, and the structures that can result are essentially given in Lewis structural form in the lab manual. One way this can happen, and arguably the more bizarre way, is that the chlorine atom, Cl+, kind of plops itself down between the two doubly bonded atoms. Carbons 1 and 2 were doubly bonded in the original structure to make this triangular three-membered ring intermediate called a chloronium. The overall formula of this is C3H6Cl+. And what we're going to do with this is optimize its geometry, and that'll come out looking something like this. And then we're going to look at the energy of this structure, which is a measure of its stability, which in a very real sense is a measure of the likelihood of actually seeing this in a physical reaction mixture. 
these energies you can see are changing as the geometry of the molecule is optimized and where the calculation lands or ends you'll notice is the lowest energy. So here it ended at step 13, minus 576.266 is indeed lower in energy or more stable than where we started. There's an alternative possibility for this mechanism that involves the formation of a different kind of intermediate. And that alternative possibility has sh is shown here. Essentially what we're looking at here is a structure that resulted from the association of chlorine with only one of the two doubly bonded atoms. So again, carbons two and three were doubly bonded, but in this structure, Cl plus, quote unquote, only attaches itself to carbon three, leaving carbon two with positive formal charge. And here again, we're looking at the optimized geometry. So we're going to run a geometry optimization to get this in its most stable form, you know, the most stable bond angles, bond lengths, arrangement of the bonds, all that good stuff. And then we're going to focus on the energy of this structure, which again is reflected in the sequence of energies as the geometry is optimized and can also be obtained using a molecular energy calculation on this structure using new job, uh, using this geometry. Either way, we're going to compare this energy of the optimized structure here to the energy of the optimized chloronium ion that we looked at previously. And again, to rehash the main point here, the lower energy, more stable structure is more likely to be the physical intermediate that actually occurs in the midst of the reaction mechanism. And judgments like this are made all the time. I really, I can't overstate the importance of this kind of thinking when computation is used to reason about reaction mechanisms. It happens all the time that chemists use calculations to support the intermediacy of a particular structure in the course of a mechanism, and it's growing in importance every day. So this video hopefully has given you an overview of the kind of three different parts of the experiment, A, B, and C, and the purposes of each. And really, I hope the experiment highlights for you that the importance of computational chemistry and really pushing forward our understanding of um, molecular structure and really theories of electrons and molecules. Computers allow us to do things and, and make judgments and obtain real data, you know, real insightful data that we couldn't possibly obtain any other way. And, and just to kind of give an overview of, of all the calculations you'll do, I should warn you that my job manager has a number of calculations that you won't need to do. Your final job manager, once you've done all the calculations, will um, go up to something like like this with possibly a few more. Everything I'm highlighting here are the calculations required to complete this experiment.